Once again, our sermon text from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of our Lord. Dear people loved by God, the sound of palm branches waving, the footfalls of a colt, the foal of a donkey, at first on rock and dirt and then on cloaks spread across the ground. And as you watch them go by, just above those clumsy hooves, the sandaled feet of a man sitting sideways so as not to drag his feet on the ground. This is a triumphant entry? Well, if you knew prophecy, it definitely was. And yet to the world, well, You've seen the beginning of even a college football game where the triumphant players, these warriors, come bursting out, right? And they're acknowledging that they are going to crush their enemy, the opposing team. They are going to exalt themselves by their dances in the end zones and the number of yards run and the passes completed. Or maybe in war, one seeks to conquer their enemies through fear by crushing morale, or maybe conversely, by crushing economies, and on and on and round and round. But here, we have something much different, don't we? And to understand what's going on in this Palm Sunday, we're going to fast forward this morning about 30 years to about 61 A.D., From a prison in Rome, Paul writes to the mostly Gentile congregation in a place called Philippi, a congregation that he started about 10 years before. He's sitting in jail here, his first congregation in Europe. And by God's grace, this congregation had been a wonderful help to Paul's gospel ministry, even giving to their brothers and sisters in need out of their extreme poverty. They didn't give their leftovers. How did that come to be? Now, in this congregation, it seems, as if you would read a little further on in this epistle, that there are two individuals in the congregation who have very strong opinions. They are sisters in Christ, who have fought for the spread of the gospel right along with Paul. And yet their very strong opinions and positions had had the effect of causing fractures in the congregation. And so Paul encourages their unity in a beautiful way. And he points them back to this Palm Sunday. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Far more than a mere attitude adjustment, Paul uses the word phroneo here, which means after considering something mentally and spiritually, you come to hold a belief, a certain view, a worldview, a point of view, a a lens through which you view the whole world around you. And it makes us consider what we 
grab onto in this life? What we grasp for? What are you constantly holding on to or trying to keep a hold on in this life? Often, that has to do with exalting ourselves in some way, right? We grasp at things that would maybe help lift up or prop up our pride or maybe help lift up our, our finances or our creature comforts or, as da- just as dangerous, our own sense of accomplishment even within ministry in God's church imagining that it must look a certain way, that success must look like fill in the blank. Paul is encouraging a certain worldview that is entirely tied up with the man riding into Jerusalem on what the world and any Gentile would consider an extraordinarily humble way. Who is this guy? We read in verse 6, who being in very nature God. This man, with nothing physically stunning about his appearance to draw people's attention to him, this man who looked just like any other Jewish man, he was truly and fully God. Now think of what that means. That means that he has the right to everything. He is God, okay? And yet, what does it say? He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or something to be used to his own advantage, but made himself nothing. He made himself what? Nothing. That means he set aside his rights. He set aside his rights. Now just stop and think about what this might look like. What would it look like in your life to make yourself nothing? What would that mean, letting go of? What would that mean, loosening your grasp on? What would it look like to give up your rights? What would it look like in your marriage to set down your rights? What would it look like in your job? What would it look like in your relationships? What would that look like even as you do life and encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ to lay down your rights? I want you to understand this does not mean becoming irrelevant or insignificant. Quite the opposite. It may be one of the most important and relevant things that you ever do to reveal your Savior to another human being. Paul further clarifies, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, the way Jesus, true man and true God, made himself nothing, was to take on the very nature of a servant. That's what he grasps at. That's what he holds onto tightly, is the nature of a servant. Instead of his divine rights, he sets those aside, he lets go of them, and he grasps onto the nature of a servant. And Paul is encouraging the Philippians and even his wonderful, strong-headed sisters in Christ, Oyodia and Syntyche, to hold on to the mindset, the worldview of Christ, to hold tightly to being servants to one another. 
He would say in Philippians 4, verse 2, I plead with Iodia and Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. You know, in general, I suppose you would say South Dakotans are pretty patriotic people, right? 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 Sure. Right? We, we love our rights. We love our rights, right? We hold on to our rights. That is something that perhaps you have in common with the people of Philippi, right? their patriotism. You see, when you retired from the Roman military, you didn't get a pension and a paycheck in your bank account. The electronic deposits weren't set up back then. And so what you got was a piece of land. And that's what Philippi was. Right? All around, these plots of land that were given to faithful military families right, who had served in the, in the Roman military. So think of, then, the Roman cross from the typical resident of Philippi's point of view. Right? That's, a, that's a sign of their country. That's a sign of what they fought for. I mean, it's a, a symbol of Rome's might and their power and their wealth a symbol that gave them the right to the very land that they lived on and worked on, as many a retired military family would have in that area. And this Jesus, who the Philippian congregation worshipped and confessed, think of this, he became obedient even to that cross. He submitted even to that cross. It says in verse 8, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, if you look at your, your Bible, an interesting note about this, sometimes these verses right here are indented a little bit different, and that's because it was probably a hymn that they sang. Isn't that cool? And so he's quoting an early, an early Christian hymn that is talking all about Jesus. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This worldview, this worldview does not come naturally to us. It is impossible even for our sinful nature. Even the very first sin boasted the pride and the arrogance of thinking, I can do this God thing better than God himself can. And ever since then, we are naturally inclined to pursue our own exaltation, the lifting up of myself. And it is at the root of even uh, of most of the strife that we find in our marriages, among our family and friends, and even among our Christian friends. Sometimes we may even try to exalt ourselves by declaring ourselves to be on fire for Jesus. I am so on fire for Jesus. Right? Ready to go out and fight for his kingdom. That's okay. But what exactly do you imagine that to look like? What exactly do you imagine that to be? Because what Paul points to here to the whole Philippian congregation, to you and me today, and even to Oyodia and Syntyche, who had very strong opinions on what being on fire for Jesus was all about. What Jesus points, or what Paul points to here, is a Jesus who set aside his rights. He humbled himself. He took on the very nature of a servant. He was humbly riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, to conquer his enemies by what? By surrendering to them. Is that how we picture fighting in Jesus' kingdom to look like? On the Thursday of that week, we would see him once again, like a thousand times before in his ministry, seek to win his subjects over by what? by serving them. This king is characterized by humility from beginning to end. Not only would he wash the feet of his disciples, 
But he would then go and lay down his life for them and for the whole world. Even for people who really, really, really love their rights. Indeed, his humility, the setting aside of his rights, his taking the very nature of a servant, that became our hope. The certainty of our salvation, the payment for all of our sins and all of our adversity towards humility or setting aside our rights or taking on the nature of a servant. But it also, his humility also, brought about the certainty of your own exaltation. And friends, this changes more than you think. You know, Paul is telling you and me today to share the mindset that Jesus had as he went into Jerusalem, the mindset that characterized his entire ministry. And this always falls apart when we try to do it on our own, right? Like a, a New Year's resolution. And there we are. This year, I am going to be more humble. And I am going to be more humble until I'm not. And there I am trying to enumerate all of the ways that I have been humble enough. But what if, what if, instead of always worrying about and trying to exalt ourselves, what if you knew that God is the one who wants to exalt you? Would that change your mindset a little bit? Think of that. All the things that we hold on to and grasp at in order to exalt ourselves in some way. When all along, God is the one who wants to exalt you and plans to exalt you. In verse 9 again, we see, Therefore God exalted him, that is Jesus, to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Your hope, your certainty, is the forgiveness of your sins. But it is also the certainty that in him, in Jesus, you will be exalted with him on that last day that you will actually reign together with him. Instead of us always trying in vain to exalt ourselves, God is the one who is planning on lifting you up on that last day. And so Paul's encouragement here is to, yes, give up our rights and take on the nature of a servant. That comes from your situation being absolutely secure in Jesus. Otherwise, otherwise, we're nervous about this. Right? This is kind of a scary prospect for us. It's terrifying to think of becoming nothing in the world or in my marriage. What if I become nothing? You know, what if the world walks all over me? Well, what if what if I'm marginalized? <gasps> what if I'm canceled? Well, what if someone takes advantage of my serving them? That might happen. What if I'm not accomplishing great and glorious looking things for Jesus in this world? Friends, in Christ, your future is secure. The certainty of your exaltation one day, that is secure. And that is why, right now, we can become nothing in this life without fear. Because he has given you everything. That is why you can view your whole world and life in this way. That is why you can take on the nature of a servant in your marriage, in your family, even as a parent, at your job, even among your brothers and sisters in Christ. 
And that might be one of the most relevant things that they ever see you do. Because it has the tendency to reflect our king who made himself nothing and took on the very nature of a servant to save us and to exalt us. You know, Philippi really was full of all of this. I mean, you had Lydia, whose household was baptized, and believing his words about Jesus became what? What did she become? A servant to all, opening up her home as probably the first likely gathering place of the congregation there. And later, remember you had Paul and Silas who are in the dungeon there and, and the earthquake and the jailer's about to kill himself, but he hears Paul and Silas call out to him. He calls for lights and he wonders what he must do to be saved. And there, in that torchlight, in an otherworldly glory that you never would have noticed if you were just looking at the situation that day, Paul and Silas, a humble mess, simply told him, to believe in the one that made them sing for joy even though they were in chains and sitting in that dungeon. And then that same jailer became the servant, didn't he? As he washed their wounds and his whole family was baptized and became a part of that Philippi congregation. And then there was Epaphroditus, whom the Philippians sent to minister to Paul while he was in prison. And the whole congregation giving out of their poverty to help minister to their brothers and sisters in Christ, whom they had never even met. They took on the nature of servants. Why? All because their king came to love and serve them first even when they were his enemies. And he came to love and serve them, even to the point of laying down his life for them on the cross. May this not be merely our attitude, but our whole mindset, our whole world view as we follow our Savior to the home and the future that he has secured for us through his perfect life and his innocent death and his glorious resurrection from the dead. Hosanna, the crowds cried that day. Lord, save us. Save us now. So we cry it too. Hosanna. Save us from our sin and from our pride and our arrogance. You humbly laid down your life to secure our hope and certainty in your promises and the future that you have established for us. And so now, because you have saved us, Lord, make us nothing. Make us nothing in this world. Help us every day to set aside whatever rights that we imagine that we are owed and cause us instead to be servants to one another and to you that still more may come to know their servant King Jesus. And so, Lord, ride on, ride on in majesty. Ride on in lowly pomp to die. O Christ, your triumphs now begin, or captive death and conquered sin. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.